So uh, my name is Russ Scammell, and um, that's Joe Rubin. And uh, we are product evangelists for Unity. We cover Southeast Asia, Australia, New Zealand, and India. Um, and today we want to share a couple of things, a couple of workshops that we've been uh, sharing with people and we found good response and we wanted to bring it to you guys here in Casual Connect. So mine will be on architecting games in Unity where I want to share some common patterns that um, uh, we have discovered in developing games um, and uh, share that with you guys, some best pra practices as well. And Joe will be talking about Mechanim the animation system in Unity and doing a session on that. Okay, so I'm going to start with architecting games in Unity. So what we've done, what we've found um, as, as we've been around the region is that a lot of people, um, they, they know what they want to do, they know what they want to make, but they don't know how to start. Or if they, if they have started, they've started on uh, shaky foundations. So I'd like to talk to you guys about some of the architecting principles that we use and share some of the common patterns that my team and I have found useful in developing games in Unity. But first, I'd like to ask all of you a question. If this was your house, what would you do? So how many of you would, can I get a show of hands, how many of you would move? Let's get out of here. Yeah? Okay. And how many of you would bulldoze it? Just get rid of it. Yeah? Okay. And how many of you would call the police? Because you've obviously been broken into many, many times. <laughs> yeah? Cool. I probably would too. But we're going to recommend that you simply fix the windows. There was nothing wrong with that building apart from the windows. Yeah? They were just broken. So it's been found that in New York City, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and in the Netherlands, improving the physical appearance of a neighborhood has been linked to reduced crime, especially petty crime, and increased quality of life. So why does this happen? So people are influenced by their environment. The environment builds social norms, and when, when people see a good environment, they want to move in, families move in, um, people want to keep it clean, and people have a sense of ownership over their neighborhood, right? Now, if you have a dirty neighborhood, a badly maintained neighborhood, then you have the someone else's problem problem, right? This is not, it's not my problem. I didn't do this. I didn't mess this up. He did. They did. My neighbors did, right? Uh, so there's lack of ownership, and people uh, feel less connected to their environment. There's a higher chance that people will not care. So there's a loss of value and ownership. So what does this have to do with games? Okay, so Unity. Unity is a great game engine. Right? We have a rich set of building blocks. You've got physics, you've got UI, you've got um, all sorts of ways of making games in Unity, 2D, 3D, you can do it all. And it's flexible. So you can do things in many different ways. In fact, we found hundreds of ways in which developers build projects. And yes, they use every one of these hundreds of ways. So as an evangelist, we've seen many projects and uh, spoken to many developers. And the central issue whenever there is a problem with a project, it's always architecture. The problems that are faced from a shaky foundation arise much later on in the project. And by that time, it's really too difficult to go back and start all over again. So let's have a look at the kind of things that we've seen. So this is a contrived example of a combination of issues that we've seen in many projects. So this is 
regarding uh, project architecture. Okay. Okay, so first thing. If you guys are, uh, if you've seen Unity before, you know the console view, which shows all the warnings and errors. So of course you're going to be fixing your errors, but it's very common to see projects with tons of warnings just left sitting in the console view. People are not looking at them or wondering where they're coming from, and they just leave them there. And if you're developing a project, and you're not looking at your warnings, and you have an idea of what it may be, but you don't fix it immediately, then you come back a week later and maybe you no longer know. Or you're not communicating with your team clearly about these warnings, you're not tracking them, and uh, that becomes a problem. So over here, in the project view, so in the first place, why are all these assets in the root folder? So we see this quite a lot, especially when projects were started quickly and uh, needed to be done you know, uh, rapid with rapid prototypes. And um, it's really hard to tell what's going on if you open a project like this. So if you've got all these different things, scenes and materials, right, scripts and, and textures, all sitting in the root folder. And the naming is really, really hard to understand. So sometimes you see 03 underscore MN SCN. Could that be menu scene or main scene? Hard to know. And that one's the art director's idea. So let's, let's, let's name that differently, but leave it in the root folder. It's really, really a mess. Yeah. So no one seems to know what's going on when your projects look like this. So <coughs> what we want to do is create something that's solid and robust. right? So most of the later problems will never occur if the earlier architecting uh, issues are resolved. So let's look at what you need. We've got all these great features in Unity, but what you really need is a structure that you can reuse for efficiency and robustness. So how do we do this? So good architecture starts with good standards. So we're going to recommend, first of all, that you use C Sharp. We support a variety of languages, but C Sharp is the way to go. Right? The community is moving over to C Sharp. It's a strongly typed language, which uh, lends itself to lexical analysis. So therefore, you can track your bugs. You know what's going wrong. You get useful error information in the console and in debugging. Also. You want to use naming conventions. You want to use descriptive names. This is very pedantic. This is very programming 101. But it's amazing how many people don't do this. So early on in your projects, use descriptive names. Use standardized capitalization. And in Unity, don't be afraid of spaces and names. Not in your scripts, but everywhere else, it's good. You want a logical folder structure. right? You want to keep your project organized, so you want Scenes, folders to hold scenes, textures, folders to hold textures. And then you want to develop a zero tolerance for warnings and errors. Errors you're going to fix because you can't compile your project otherwise. But warnings, we see a lot of people leaving these there and then they come back later and haunt your project. And then the last one, which I'm going to spend some time on today, especially if you're developing for devices, you want to develop a zero tolerance for runtime memory allocation. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to avoid memory allocation in the update loop. So we'll look at that later. So let's look at an, an example of a project that's a little better organized. <coughs> OK, so the first thing is we have no errors. No errors, no warnings. So this is good. This is what you want. You want an empty console view. And in the project, so let's zoom in a bit so we can have a look. Now, within a minute of opening this project, you know where you are. You can navigate it easily because things are named clearly. You can get to the source of the 
issue or you can get to the asset that you want to get to. You can organize yourself uh, very easily, especially if you start with a set of logical folders. So materials in the materials folder, prefabs in the prefabs folder, and so on. Cool. So really, for project architecting, in a phrase, stay organized. Yep, that's all we want. Um, and uh, you'll find that a lot of things become a lot easier. And it's easier to see potential issues. OK, so the second thing I want to talk about is core application logic. So this is a fancy way of saying, how do you run the basic, the basic trunk of your project? How do you run that? And the way we want to do it, the, the, way the thing we want to talk about today is a main controller. So this is a base controller that exists throughout the application and acts as a high-level application controller. So this uses public static methods, so everyone in the, in the project can access it. And we use object don't destroy on load, so it's available throughout the project. So other scenes in the project are loaded on top of this. And this controller loads and unloads and manages memory and cleans up. OK? So how are we going to get this to work? First, we're going to have a look at a couple of diagrams that explain this. And then later on, we'll look through the code. And finally, at the end of the presentation, I'll share a template with you guys, which is the scene that we saw earlier, so that you can have a look at how it works for yourselves. OK. So the main controller is a <coughs> scene loading state machine. OK, so it's a state machine that you have in the main scene of the project. And its main role, one of the central roles, is to load and unload other scenes. And it does this via a series of states. So the first state, in the first state, called the reset state, all we want to do is reclaim some memory. So you don't want to do this all the time, which is why we do it as a state machine. You want to do it at the very beginning and exercise some control on when this happens. So we call GC collect, which is a request for, for memory cleanup. And we do this in the reset state. We keep it out of the runtime loop because that would be terrible for performance. And then, starting from the menu scene, we want to load the levels asynchronously. Okay, so we have a preload state. And in the preload state, it's a place to run processes that you want to run just before loading. But it's also where we change, sorry, where we start loading the level. So this is done as an asynchronous operation. Then we switch over to the load scene. In this, we simply load the game scene. We do this uh, asynchronously, and then we check. And when we're done, we transition to unloading. So in unloading, we're doing something where we clean up unused resources. Okay, So we're using resources unload unused assets. This is also asynchronous. And then we keep going until unloading is done. So as you can see here, throughout all these processes, the main controller has stayed at the bottom. Yeah, That never goes away. Unused resources are cleaned up, and the game scene remains. And then we swap over to the post, uh, the post load state. So this is the place where you want to run processes immediately after loading. Something we do here in our code is update a variable called current scene name. So we use two variables, current and next scene name, to track which scene you are in. And um, we allow other processes to change that via a static public method. We'll look at that again later. And then, so we're done. Loading's done. We're not in the game yet. We go to the ready state. This is just before running. It's our last chance to run GC collect. So we can do this here, but you want to be careful if you've got any unused stuff that you actually want to use. Uh, so this is an optional step. We found that it works well on some devices and not so well on others. So add according to your taste. Right. 
this is also a good place where you want to do things just before you start the game. For example, maybe you want to put up a splash screen about your game that says something like, did you know that plasma tanks are immune to cold attacks? This is where you could do stuff like that. Or the, the old standard press any key to continue. OK, and then we get to the run state. So we did all of this to get to the run state. And then we stay here, and we're only checking for current level and seeing whether the current level name ever uh, is, is ever different from the next level name. If that happens, then we start the whole loading process again. And we start from the refe uh, reset state. <coughs> so this can only be changed by the switch scene static public method, which we'll have a look at later. OK, so we got there. This is where we wanted to get to. Now, how do we do this? So how do we implement this scene state machine? So we can use a switch case. We've seen this done before. Um, that's OK. But it gets difficult to maintain and read. Um, you're going to spend a lot of time maintaining your code. You're going to have your code in front of you most of the time, not writing it. So you want it to be readable. So um, it's a good idea to use delegates. Unfortunately, delegates break one of our zero tolerance principles. Setting a delegate allocates memory. And that will build up after a while and cause trouble. So we are going to use an array of delegates. OK, so how do we do that? Let's take a look at the implementation of this scene state machine. OK. So in this project, we have a main scene. And we have a menu scene and we have a game scene. So in the main scene, we've got just one thing called a primary camera. And attached to the primary camera is our main controller script. So this is the thing that we walked through earlier. OK, so let's take a look at that. OK. Can you guys see that back there? Is that cool? OK. So, so the main controller, in the main controller, we um, define a singleton called main controller, of type main controller. We keep track of two strings, current scene name and next scene name. We um, have two asynchronous operations, resource unload task. This is the one that we use to unload unused assets. And we have a scene load task. And then we have an enumeration of scene states. And these are, as you can see, the same names as the scenes that we had earlier. Reset, preload, load, unload, postload, ready, run, and count. Now, count is not a, s uh, not a state. But this is useful to use in enumerations because it means that you can access the number of elements in the enumeration. So if you have count as your last element and you get that from the enum, you get the number of elements in the enum. And then we have a scene state of type scene state. And then we define an update delegate with this signature. OK. And then this is what we do. We create an array of update delegates called update delegates. OK. So what happens when we start up? So first of all, we keep this alive between scene changes. And the way we do this is with object don't destroy on load. And then we set up the singleton instance. And then we set up the array of update delegates. And then, and this is where we avoid setting delegates in the update loop. We do this all in the awake. And we do scene state, we, we set, sorry, we cast scene state reset to an integer. We take that index from the update delegates array, and we set it to the update scene reset method. And we do this for each of the states. So we've got an update method for each state. And then we set the next scene name to menu scene, which means we start with a menu scene. 
And then we set the scene state to scene state reset, which is what we want to do. We want to start with the reset state. OK. So the first of the broken windows gets fixed here. Very often, we're not kind to memory. So as you exit, we do some stuff in on destroy. We want to clean up all of the update delegates. So we check if the array itself is not null. If it isn't, then we go through all the elements, and we set them to null. And then we set the array itself to null. And then we clean up the singleton instance. If that's not null, set it to null. OK. Now in the update loop, all we're doing is checking if the scene state variable, as cast to an integer, if that element in the update delegates array, if that's not null, then we invoke the uh, method that we set earlier. So we're never setting anything in the update loop. Which brings us to the series of methods that represents the scene state loading state of the scenes, I'm sorry. So the first one is our update scene reset. Now here we run a GC pass. Very simple, system GC collect. In the second one, and then we, uh, sorry, we switch to the preload state. And then in the preload state, we start the asynchronous operation where we want to load the scene. So scene load task, load level async, next scene name. OK. Now we're just starting it here. We're going over to the load state next. And we stay here. We keep looping and checking if scene load task is done. And if it is, that means we're done loading, so we can start unloading. If it is not done, we enter this area here where we can update some kind of scene loading progress bar on the screen. So this is where you could do your loading progress bar. And then, so we're done loading, the async operation is done, we come over to update scene unload. Now here we want to clean up resources. So we check, make sure that this asynchronous operation is null, and then we set it to resources unload unused assets, and then we keep checking if it's done cleaning up yet. So we stay in this method until resource unload task is done is true. And if it is, we set the async operation to null, and we set the scene state to postload, which sends us here. So all we do in postload is set the current scene name to the next scene name. So now they are the same. For example, when we begin, they will both be menu scene here. And then we go over to ready. And then once we get to update scene ready, we can do another system GC collect. Again, I've left a warning comment here to make sure that this is optional. You can try it, see if it works for you and your devices. If you run into trouble, you want to get rid of this GC collect here. But it's your last chance before you enter the game. And then finally, we get to update scene run. Now in update scene run, the main controller finally takes a back seat, and it's only doing one check, which is, is the current scene name not equal to the next scene name. And if that ever happens, we change to scene state reset. OK. So how can that ever change? So there's one static public method here called switch scene. And this can be called, and it is called, by two other controllers, the menu controller and the game controller, which we will look at in a short while. And all you do is you pass it the next scene name as a string, and if that is not equal to, if the current scene name is not equal to that already, then you set it to that. And by doing that, you create an inequality that drives the um, state to reset. OK. So let's look at the other scenes. There's a menu scene. And in the menu scene, all we've got is an info text and a main camera. And the main camera has just one thing attached to it, a menu controller. And in the game scene, you have something similar, where you have 
some other things in the hierarchy and a main camera and on the main camera is our game controller. So what do these scripts look like? Okay, so the menu controller is a very simple singleton. Again, we're being kind to memory in awake and on destroy, but all we do in the update loop is check. If we click the left mouse button, then main controller dot switch scene to the game scene. So that means if I click left, I'm going to switch scenes. Similarly, in the game controller, we do the same thing. Okay, single turn, clean up in on destroy, and then in the update loop, if we left click, main controller switch scene, menu scene. Okay, so what does that look like? So we start from the main scene. It's not very clear here, but you can see there's just one thing sitting in the hierarchy. Okay, we'll run it and then I'll zoom in to show you what happens. So when I hit play, you can see that the primary camera is still there from the main scene. And we've loaded in the info text and the main camera from the uh, menu scene. And if I left click, you can see everything unloaded from the menu scene. And um, we've cleaned up, and the primary camera is still there because we're using object don't destroy on load. And we've loaded in all the uh, game objects from the game, from the game scene. So we're going to look at the game scene as well in a short while and see what we're doing in there that's useful for um, making games. Cool. Okay, so that is how you get your um, scene loading to work without allocating any memory. Right, so let's look at that in the profiler as well. So if you've got the profiler open, and can I get a show of hands from, from the audience as well? I'm curious about this for, for my purposes. Um, how many of you use the profiler on a daily basis? How many of you use Unity on a daily basis? Okay, cool. So the, the profile is a really good way of getting into your project, looking at how um, processing cycles are going, how, how much time is spent in rendering, and how much memory is being applied. So let's take a look at how we can use it here. Okay. So. This is the CPU profiler. And what we're looking at here is garbage collection. So we can actually detect spikes in garbage collection. We can actually see when the garbage collector is invoked, which on devices is a big deal because that's where you're going to get your slowdowns. OK? And we can also see who is responsible for creating all this garbage by looking down here in the hierarchy. So if we hit play, You can see a couple of spikes at the beginning, and those are our two GC collect calls. So we're, being, we're exercising some control over where that happens. Because I'm running this in the editor, you're going to occasionally see a GC collect spike caused by an editor overhead. But otherwise, it's quiet. This is a good thing. If we click again, you can see we've got our three cleanups, right? That's all stuff that we've controlled. We know that that's going to happen, and then nothing else happens again in the update loop. So this is good. So we're never going to have trouble from the uh, scene loading. Sometimes what happens is you load a lot of stuff at the beginning in the scene. You keep going, and about five seconds into the game, there's a hiccup. And that's usually from unused resources getting cleaned up automatically. And that's what we're trying to avoid. OK. So, third thing we want to talk about in terms of making games, the actual game making part, right? So you want to implement some gameplay. So how would you do this? So some basic principles, in terms of managing the objects, we use controllers, 
So this is very simple. A player object has a player controller, an enemy object has an enemy controller, and so on. So for inter-object communication, Unity has a bunch of methods that you can find out about. There's a lot of documentation on this online. Um, what we use for, for um, singletons especially is static public methods. Or you can use the temporary public instance methods, or you can use messages and events. But what we want to talk about today are the two patterns that you see a lot in games, which are singletons and pooling or pool controllers. Okay. So singletons are very basic. Anyone who's done any code knows that you use a singleton when there's only one of them in the scene, and you use static. We can use static public methods to access the me the um, singletons and do things with them. So this is good when you've only got one of these things in the world. For example, your score. You've just got one score. Or the player. There's only one player. If it's single player, there's only one player. Or the world, or the game. So that's a good place to use a singleton. We've actually used a few already. Our main controller is a singleton. OK. So let's have a very brief look at that again. So in the game scene, we have a couple of cubes, some, some blue cubes and a red cube. Uh, we're going to spend a bit of time in this scene, so let's get to know it. The spawn point in the middle is this red cube. Uh, that's a spawn point. Sorry. And then each of these blue things is an agent. So because we've only got one of these spawn points in the level, we're going to use a singleton to uh, control that. And let's have a look at the spawn point controller that is attached to the spawn point. OK. So very simple. We have a private static variable of type spawn point controller called spawn point controller. And the way we make sure that we clean up and set our, our singleton instance is in awake, we do spawn point controller equals this. And on destroy, we check if it's not null, and if it's not, we set it to null. That's all we do. So really not much to say on singletons. Sorry. OK. So the more interesting pattern, and the one we want to talk about because it relates to memory allocation, is pooling, or pool-based objects. So this is when you want to have numerous instances of these objects in the world, but you want to do this with a limited number of them at any one time. So the way we do this, we have a very simple method for creating pools, and that we, we do this by preloading simultaneously all the, all the, element, all the uh, game objects that we need, all the prefabs that we need. Uh, we disable them, and then we use a static public method to spawn one and we do this by checking through a list and finding the first disabled one and using that, enabling it and using that. So when do you want to use pools? Almost everywhere. So your game is full of pools. Um, examples are, of course, things like special effects, explosions, or the bullets in a bullet hell game, or the enemies, or your scenery objects, or your props. You can use them throughout your game. So how do what does this look like? So rather than instantiating an object every time you need it, what you want to do is load game objects from storage, place them in a pool like these bullets here, and then disable them. And then when you need them, like the gun is going to try to fire a bullet, all we do is request an object from the object pool. So the gun is requesting one, and it gets one, and it flies off screen, and then he runs out. So now there's no more objects in the pool. What do we do? This is no good. You can't make a very cool game with five bullets. So we need one last step, which is we need to send them back to the pool when we're done. You want to recycle. Yep. So game objects are deactivated, in this case, when they go off screen and then return to the pool. OK. 
So let's take a look at the agent controller, which is the object in this uh, in the game where we do this. Okay. So again, the spawn point is the red guy, the red cube, and he has a spawn point controller script attached to him. And then each of the agents, these are the agents, these blue guys here, each of those has a agent controller script attached to them. Okay, so we've got five agents in the screen, similar to the bullets that we saw earlier. And the idea is when the game is playing and you hit the space bar, an agent is spawned. Okay, so how do we do that? So let's take a look at the agent controller. Okay, so how do we implement a pool? So we're still kind of using singletons here, except it's a singleton list. So you just need one list to hold all the agents. In this case, it's a static private list of agent controllers called agent controllers. We'll come back to this spawn method later. This is how we spawn. But what do we do in the awake method? Okay, so first of all, we want to check if the pool exists. So if the pool doesn't exist, we lazy initialize it. Okay, so we don't need to do that until we need it. And then, as an agent controller, when I wake up, I add myself to it. So if you have five agent controllers, the first one wakes up, checks, do I have a list? Okay, no, no list, so I create one, and then I add myself to it. The second agent controller wakes up, is there a list? Yes, so I just add myself to it. Third one adds himself to the list, fourth one, fifth one, and then all of them get disabled. So we go down to the start method, and we can see we do a game object set active false. Yep. So now you've got all these um, agents. They've woken up and they've disabled themselves. Um, a small point on on destroy. When we are done, we actually remove ourselves from the pool. So each agent controller removes itself from the pool, and then it checks if it was the last one. So if agent controllers dot count is zero, then remove the pool itself. So again, we're being kind to memory there. Okay. So, now how do we get an agent into the scene? Okay, so in the spawn point controller, we want to check if anyone's pressing the space bar. So, sorry, to keep it a bit interesting, we rotate the spawn point so that the agents will come out at different angles. We'll see that in a short while. Um, but if we check here, if we check the space bar and we see that it's been pressed down and it's true, what we do is we request an agent from the agent controller. So this is a request. There's no guarantee that you'll get one, but agent controller.spawn takes two parameters. We send it the position and the Euler angles. So what does this look like in the agent controller? Okay, so in the agent controller, this is a manager within the, within the class. What we want to do is take the location and heading that we got, and then we iterate through the agent controllers list. So for each agent controller in agent controllers, we check if it's disabled. So because what we're doing is we are pooling based on whether or not the object is disabled. So if it is, if active self is false, then we set it up agent controller dot transform position we set for location and Euler angles to heading and then we switch it back on and then we return a reference to the caller if that becomes necessary now if we run out of agents if there's more than five we get here right so I've left a little note there if we get here we haven't pulled enough agents it might be good to write a log here to make this known so this is where you can actually control how many guys you get, um, how much gets instantiated at once, and if you're testing your game, you start with five guys maybe, and you realize, hey, actually I need 20, you can add the numbers here, or you can add a debug log here so that you know that um, this is the, the number of agents that you need. Okay. And then, so 
So what does an agent controller do once it's alive? It travels in a straight line. Okay, very boring. Doesn't do anything particularly interesting. But there's also an on became invisible test. So if we leave the screen, disable ourselves so that we're available again. So if on became invisible, right? If the agent has left the screen, we get set active false. Okay. Let's see all of that in action. Okay. So we're going to start from the game scene and we're going to look at these guys here. So if you look in the hierarchy, we've got five agents that are all active. And let's see what happens when we hit play. So they all got deactivated. And if we look at the scene, we can actually see all we've got in the scene is this rotating red cube and there's nothing else. Okay. So let's take a look at what happens when we fire something. So when I hit the space bar, hey, you've got one agent. So he took the location and heading of the spawn point, placed himself at the spawn point and activated himself. But what's more interesting is if you look in the hierarchy, they're all disabled and when you hit the space bar, one of them gets turned on. If you hit it twice, they get two. And they're turning off as they leave the screen. So you've got a bunch of pre-instantiated game objects that just get enabled and disabled as you need them and you're never allocating memory at runtime. So this is very, very useful. Cool. OK. So I've shared the template of this project here for you guys. Um, you can download it. Uh, it contains the scene state machine that we talked about earlier. Uh, it contains the pooling code. So this is something that it would be really cool if you guys could take a look at it, see how it, uh, how, how it could improve um, your project, how it can be used to reduce especially runtime memory allocation. And please take it, modify it, make it your own. But as you do, please remember the core principles at work here. We want you to use C Sharp. We want you to use good naming conventions. That's just common sense. That's just really nice. Uh, please use logical folder structures. You know, you want to be able to navigate your projects. You want your team to be able to navigate their projects together. Please develop a zero tolerance for warnings and errors, especially warnings, no more yellows. And then we want to, you want to try to develop, this can be tricky, you want to try to develop a zero tolerance for runtime memory allocation. This will pay off in the long run and it will turn game development back into the joy that it always was meant to be. So thank you so much, guys, for listening to me talk today. And um, if you have any questions and answers, uh, questions that I can answer, um, I'll, I'll be happy to take some. Thank you. <laughs> Are there any questions? Yes? Uh, sorry, I, I just didn't Hiya. get the link. Would you mind? Oh, of course. That? Yeah. <laughs> That's the most common question I sorry. get. Sorry. <laughs> sure, of course, guys. Yes. So I want to ask about the object pooling. Yes. Um, you, so you actually instantiate the mm -hmm. object right away, right? But mm -hmm. what if the player was like um, mm -hmm. spamming it around? Mm -hmm. Okay. For example, the bullet is, you know, you just instantly at five, right? Mm -hmm. um, what if they ask for 100 mm -hmm. at the same time? Like yep. How would you do that? At the same time? Well, uh, well, like, like a the machine gun or like a the space bar or so on. Right. Okay. Yeah. So if you needed more than one at the same time, then you would use the same method because he's spamming, right? So he's still, he's still hitting the space bar to get each one. Yeah. So you actually like rate yeah. five, right? But the player want more, yeah. but you only make five in the yeah. game. How, how mm -hmm. you do that? So how, how you can solve that? Okay, so 
If the player wants more, you need to play test and find how much the player wants and track that number and create that many. So the idea is to pre-instantiate as many as you need. So the reason that we only limit it to five for this one is so that you can see what happens. Otherwise, I'd have 100, 100 uh, bullets in the game. But for a machine gun, for example, you, you may need 100 bullets, right? If you and five other players are in a multiplayer game and each one has a machine gun firing you know, 40 rounds per second, yeah, you're going to need a lot more. So yes. So what we did there also, if you look at the code when you download it, when you've iterated through the list and you get to the end, you realize you, you've, you've, um, you've get you're getting a request for a bullet, but one is not there, one is not being prepared, this is a good place for you to track, right? My players need more bullets, so leave a little debug there, add more bullets. That's one. The other way you can do it on PC, not doesn't work so well on, on devices, is you can actually have an instantiate there. So you can have a pool of 20 to start with, and then if you ever hit the limit, you can instantiate another 20 every time someone you know, uh, breaks the bank. Yep. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, I just want to know: um, during the runtime, would you check the memory allocation in real time and? Um, would you have any um, kind of memory deallocation if you find that you are running low on, on resources? At runtime? When you're playing the game, yeah. Yeah, so the, the idea with, with a managed system like, like Unity's is that that happens, that happens um, automatically, but you don't want it to happen. So the whole objective of, of controlling your memory, of, of reining it in, is that you don't want the automatic garbage collection to kick in. So it's good. It means you don't have to track your references, right? But um, there is an overhead. And if that overhead is happening in the middle of a bullet hell game, for example, you're going to lose your players instantly. No one's going to want to play a game that hiccups. So you actually don't want to clean up memory during your update loop. You, n you want to avoid that as much as possible. But but what happens when you do run out of memory, or you're running very low? So yep. I'm thinking like a mm -hmm. tower of defense game, mm -hmm. and you have missiles like firing, and then yep. you from ten missiles maybe you have mm -hmm. um, five hundred. <laughs> okay. Suddenly the frame rate starts to drop. Right. How would you handle that in the game? So if you have five hundred missiles in the game, the frame rate is dropping because of. Um, I'm not sure, but that's what happens when I play the game. <laughs> right, <laughs> okay. So I would look back at how you are architecting that system rather than trying to fix it by deallocating resources at runtime. So it sounds like you're letting the problem get too far and then you're fixing it with a, with a, with a plaster. I'm, I'm actually talking about a commercial game that I've been playing, so I, I, I ah, see Tower okay. Madness. <laughs> okay, yeah. so you've I seen this in commercial games. Yeah. Yes, I see oh yeah. it, and, and then I'm, oh I'm wondering whether right. should we do some special oh yeah. kind of programming right. to, to prevent that. Maybe yeah. you, you don't allow the user to fire off something. Yeah. Uh, you know, and that yeah. would, yeah. So exactly, so the way we do it here is we request something from a pool. So if you're actually, if you, if you want to, if you want to be, if you want to be kind to the frame rate but mean to the player, right? This is not a bad way to do it. So you have you have a you have a um, pool, and you're requesting from the pool. And if there's not enough in the pool, then nothing happens. So this is good for special effects, not so good for missiles in a tower defense game because people will get annoyed if they if it's if it's not firing. But special effects, people can forgive sometimes if it's like, yeah, there was no explosion, but the enemy died. So cool, yeah. But we don't, maybe we don't have to pull so many explosions. So I would approach it that way. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, sure. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, hi. Uh, hi, yeah. Uh, just now you said uh, when you declare a delegate, it will allocate a memory. But uh, why is it when you say the solution is to declare an array of delegate, then it won't allocate a memory? Okay. Can you further explain that? 
So it's when you're setting a delegate that it allocates memory. And what a lot of people do when they use a delegate for a state machine is they use a single delegate, and then in the update loop, based on conditions in the game, the, up the delegate gets set. So you don't want that to happen in the update loop. So what we're doing is setting an array of delegates in the await function, so then it all gets set beforehand, and then we do a GC collect. So That's we're okay. All right, thanks. Sure thing. Anyone else? I'm happy to answer all your questions. If you don't want to ask them to me now, I can also talk to you afterwards if you guys have any more questions. Yeah. I have a legitimate question, so. <laughs> uh, Fantastic. Uh, is it possible uh, mm -hmm. on a device um, mm -hmm. to have too many um, game objects, I suppose? Even if the game objects are very simple, but mm -hmm. I is there a point at which I guess a device kind of overloads at something like a thousand or something. Yes, there is a point for every device. All oh right. Yeah. Because um, I I have seen that before, mm -hmm. and if you're pooling and if mm -hmm. you need a thousand things, yep. is that a problem? It can be a problem. Right. Yes. So this comes down to your game scope, and uh, what exactly you're trying to do for devices. So there's a reason that games on a lot of devices don't have the scope in terms of game objects or in terms of level size that they would have in on PCs or whatnot, where you have a much larger amount of memory to play with. But even on a PC, you, you can throw enough at the machine that you will crash it. So yeah, we're working with finite devices, right, all the time. So yes. So sometimes, um, instead of pooling, uh, you want to segment your level up into, into different sections. So let's say you've got a game, um, and you know that you're going to need all these guns and bullets and enemies in level one, so you pool specifically for level one. And then as you load level two, however you do that, asynchronously or via a portal system, you want to unload everything that was specific to level one, keep the commonalities, bring those over to level two, and then load only what you need in level two. Something like that. Yeah. But it's usually case by case to get that to work correctly. Cool. Does that help? Yeah. yeah. Excellent.